most interesting creatures that God ever made, I think, are caterpillars and chameleons. Just think about those two things. Chameleons have the amazing ability to alter their appearance so they can blend in with what's around them. The caterpillars have the miraculous quality of changing into something completely different. The process of this change is called metamorphosis, and that's when the caterpillar appears to be lifeless and dead, even dead for a while, and it even spins its own shroud. <clears throat> You've ever seen a, a cocoon, you know what I mean. But all the while, an inner transformation is happening that effectively recreates the caterpillar into something utterly beautiful. And you know, I think we can learn a lot from caterpillars and chameleons. I'm going to ask you a question when you think about these two <clears throat> very different, um, beautiful creations of the Lord. Which one are you most like? Are you like a chameleon who's life is shaped by fitting into whatever your cultural surroundings may be? Because chameleons, you see, they never really change. They just only appear to on the outside. <coughs> or are you like the caterpillar who's being transformed into a butterfly in a process that can only be completed when you allow yourself to be really changed, essentially recreated from the inside out? And today, our topic is transformation. That's what we're going to talk about. And up to this point in his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul has showed us some of the qualities of Christian character that are a gift from the Holy Spirit. And we ended up uh, in our last um, sermon, which I think was the beginning of November, with these traits, humbleness and gentleness and patience and forbearance and love. Because the Spirit's gifts, you see, are an integral piece of transformation. That's what, what it's all about. But transformation doesn't happen to us. We have to be part of the process also. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit can do his work. And we need to make an effort. We have to work along with him. Now, Rick Warren wrote in his very famous book, Purpose, Purpose Driven Life, I know a lot of you have read it, Wrestling, shaking his head. I won't have any points to ponder today. Okay. <laughs> Inside joke, sorry. He wrote that while effort has nothing to do with your salvation, in other words, you can't earn your way to salvation, it has much to do with your spiritual growth. Because we can't do anything to earn salvation. That's God's free gift through Jesus. But there is a kind of work that we do need to do so that we will become spiritually mature. And this is the work that you need to do that's deliberate and intentional, and it takes a new perspective on both the world and on ourselves. It's a work of transformation that gets rid of the old and brings the new. So the first thing Paul urges us is we've got to get out with the old. He says, so I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding, and they are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Doesn't hold any words back, does he? <laughs> well, as new creations in Christ, Christians have to be transformed to live in new ways. And the first transformation that he talks about is our thinking. Our, our actions are not going to change unless our thoughts are changed. And the Holy Spirit is the guide to transformation. But we have to be his partner to decide to put off the old destructive thought patterns. The first thing he talks about is a darkened understanding and ignorance due to hardened hearts. What he was saying was that their thinking was tragically flawed. Their futility of thinking led to inter intellectual darkness and separation from the light of God. When you chase after the things of this world, you're chasing away from God. And so earlier in Ephesians, Paul prayed that the eyes of their hearts would be opened or enlightened. In other words, that their spirits and their minds and their emotions, because that's what's meant by the heart in the Bible, that these would receive the light that only Christ can bring to them. And now he contrasts this natural state of the unbeliever, whose heart is hard, 
with the Greek word hard meaning blind in this case. In the old life, the Christian must leave behind the spiritual blindness that contributes to intellectual darkness and ignorance. <coughs> the first thing we have to think about is our thinking. We need to put off sensuality and lust. He talks about that. <laughs> Futility of thinking and darkened understanding and spiritual ignorance and a hardened heart results in insensitivity in both toward other people and toward your own sins. So when reason and spiritual receptivity are abandoned, there's no longer any barrier to exercising sinful behavior. There's no check or balance here. And so Paul uses very strong words in this section because he didn't want anyone to misunderstand the horrible degeneration of behavior that comes out of the blackness of a mind that's devoid of God. The hardness of a heart that seeks only the insatiable and perverted sensual desires that continually and greedily are spawned in an individual who has no relationship with God or other people, except as objects to serve personal desire. I don't think this is news to us. As a matter of fact, if you tune into the news, you see it all the time, don't you? People are always putting themselves first and their desires first above anyone else. But John Stott, uh, the great John Stott, puts it this way. He said, Paul depicts the terrible downward path of evil, the hardness of heart that leads first to darkness of the mind, and then a deadness of the soul, that under the judgment of God, finally to recklessness of life. And having lost all sensitivity, people lose all self-control. So Paul goes on to show that when the old is out, we have to replace it with something new, don't we? A void always needs to be filled. So the Spirit's work of transformation is not only to help us to overcome the sinful patterns that we have in our lives, but it's to give us a new mind that is completely <clears throat> centered on a new perspective. So the old mind could only have a worldly viewpoint. That's, that's the way we're born. It can't see God. The new mind has an eternal viewpoint that not only sees God, but sees how God has connected us in love to him and to other people. Because God's love is always other-centered. Our love is self-centered. So Paul goes on in verses 20 through 24. You, however, did not come to know Christ in that way. Surely you heard of him and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. And you were taught that with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self that's being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the renewing of your minds, and to put, off, put on a new self, excuse me, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this old life, you see, is characterized by chameleon-like behavior. The non-believer looks at the world and what it offers for fulfillment in his or her life, and soon comes to reflect what that world prizes most, and also is you know, apt to be changeable in any situation to get what that person wants most. And those are tangible things, usually, pleasures that can be felt and tasted and seen and touched, but that fade away even as they're being consumed. This life of corruption becomes like a garment woven in the darkness that covers the self with the cloak of sin. But this new life is like this process of the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. The believer moves from what seems to be a state of death, because you do have to die to be in Christ. You have to die to your old life so that you can be transformed into a completely new life. So the new starts with putting off the old, he said, you didn't come to know Christ that way. Put off your old self. Get rid of your old habits, your old sins. Christ is never going to be known in that old life. The old self is motivated by those desires, and our desires are deceitful. Sinning promises self-gratification in whatever we choose. And you think about it. You, you've all got sin conditions, so do I. Whatever your sin of choice is, whether it be, I mean, the, the obvious ones in our society are drinking alcohol excessively or getting high on the drug of choice or gratifying sexual pleasure in an ever-escalating indiscriminate pattern of abuse towards others, and yourself, by the way, 
overeating to the point of obesity, or whatever your particular vice is. I mean, those are some, some of the obvious ones. But you know, it's all a lie. The short-term pleasure that you get will damage your soul, and it creates a widening abyss between you and the people that you care about, not to mention God. And this is the life that we learn to live if we stay in the old self. So when we accept Jesus, we make a conscious decision to put on the new self. We accept him as our savior. And that means he has the right now to run your life, basically. It's a life of obedience. And so that's what repentance is. That is a churchy word that we use. But repentance means reorienting yourself, turning around and going into another direction. We want to go toward Jesus and not keep running away from him. So that means when you reorient your direction, you're not going to do the same behaviors you had before. You're going to ask Jesus to give you a new orientation and new behaviors. And so when we, when we do this, we ask Jesus to make us something new. I was saying to the Bible study group this morning that the aim of Christian life is to become somebody else. You know, you hear a lot today about becoming your best self, right? your most authentic self. Well, that's not what God wants for you. God wants for you to become somebody else. He wants you to become like Jesus. That's your best self, your most authentic self. Because you're created in the image of God. And you will image God most perfectly when you become like his son. So baptism is what we do. That means we die to the old self, and we come up out of baptism as a new creation in Christ. And we publicly make a statement in baptism that we're letting go of the old nature and welcoming a new creation. But that's not enough. We have to have a new mind. When we decide to put off that old nature through Jesus, he gives us a new mind. He gives us the mind of Christ is what we get, as Paul says. And, and that means he sends the Holy Spirit to be, take up residence in us, to be the navigator for our thinking and our living. And this is an ongoing, lifelong process. The, the mind is continually being renewed by the Spirit's presence as we mature spiritually and we become more like Christ every day. So we move through earthly life into eternal life. So that's the opposite, the, the direct opposite of the old nature that progressively de degenerates our lives by sin toward death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's no way you can get around that. Somebody has to die. Well, somebody did die for you and for me. Jesus died on the cross, so we don't have to suffer death in that way. But we do need to die to our old self. And so again, this is a lifelong process. The mind is continually being renewed by the Spirit's presence. We become more mature spiritually. We become more like Christ every day. And ultimately, we are Christ when we stand before the throne of judgment, what, what God the Father will see is Christ, because he will cover us with his person, his righteousness. So this righteousness comes, and righteousness is a right relationship with God and with everybody else around us. And we need to live that out, and that process of change is called holiness, or sanctification is, is the word we use. The transformation begins in the mind but continues with behavior. And so he goes on. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. <coughs> Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Wow, that's a big list for every one of us, isn't it? And I'm sure you recognize yourself somewhere in there as I did. 
So we have to allow the Holy Spirit to bring new behavior for us. It's not just in the mind. It has ethical implications. Putting on the new self is not merely an insubstantial spiritual idea. It's not like you can sit there and meditate, um, you know, go to some interior place and you're going to repair who you are. It's lived out and proven in modified behavior. People should be able to see a difference in you. And this is a piece that's critical in the life of the church. It's not to be missed or simply paid lip service to because recreated life with new minds means new behavior. We have to be vigilant about this. We have to do it intentionally. We have to make a daily decision that we're going to act differently in accord with the Spirit's leading. We have to let the Spirit lead. Because the Spirit's going to forge in us a new behavior. And this is what he talks about, the new behavior. He gives us very concrete evidence of that. The first thing he says, put off lies. You're putting off the old self. You put off lies. You don't lie anymore. A true Christian's going to speak the truth, no matter what the cost. You need to be honest and reliable and trustworthy. And it starts with being truthful to yourself in your own heart and not allowing you to be deceived by yourself. The other thing is put off anger. All negative emotions that divide you from others, whether it's bitterness and rage and sla sla slander, excuse me, talking, you know, trash talk about people, in other words, fighting with people. I'm so sick and tired of hearing people fight, aren't you? Especially the verbal, weaponized words that we hear every day on the news. I'm, I'm up to here with it. That's not what the Lord would have for us. Paul gave great advice in giving this. I remember my father telling me this when I was a little girl. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Because then anger gets a foothold and you start nursing a grudge. Don't nurse that anger to allow it to become a smoldering and unquenched fire in you. It can lead to sin because it clouds our spirits and separates us from other people and allows the devil to begin his work. So if you had a disagreement, you know, put that to rest immediately. Put off sloth. That's an old word. <laughs> Stealing. Paul indicates here it's a form of laziness, he says. It's not just dishonesty, it's laziness. The Eighth Commandment says don't steal. We know that. But Paul goes even further. He says, get a job. <laughs> get a job. Stealing corrupts the person who steals. But that's not the, the most insidious part. It diminishes the whole community because the whole community ultimately has to make up for the loss that's perpetrated by the thief. Now, in today's world, I don't think people overtly steal. I don't know. What was the last time you shoplifted here? Yeah. I don't think I ever had. Well, I did when I was five years old. So. I stole a roll of cherry lifesavers, and my mother made me bring them back, and I've never forgotten how ashamed I was. <laughs> you learn those lessons early, hopefully. But, you know, here's a modern example. You know, a person cheating on income tax. You know, a lot of people say, oh, nobody's going to know about that. It doesn't hurt anybody, they figure. Well, it does. It hurts that person because they're being dishonest, but it also hurts the rest of us because we all have to make up those taxes, right? We all have to pay the penalty for the person who stole. So tax stealing takes away from those who really need the help through government funding, too. You know, They might have to cut programs because people don't pay their taxes. But Paul goes even further than that. Not only does he say, don't steal and, and get a job, not just make things better for yourself, in other words. I mean, that's no good, right? That just goes back to our self-centeredness. He commands the thief to give away some of his new earnings to help those who can't help themselves. Now we're getting to the final ethic of Christian living. This is the truth of community. It's to put the needs of someone else in the same category as your own needs and sometimes beyond that. Put off your trash talking. Now, many a mother has admonished her child, if you can't say something nice, you don't say anything at all. How many of you, when you were really bad, your mother made you put a bar of soap in your mouth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, yeah. Ivory soap. Oh. <laughs> Still taste it. <laughs> so think about what you say before you open your mouth. You know? <laughs> Guard against gossiping and sarcasm and persistent, persistently negative speech. That's a hard one for me. I'm a naturally pessimistic person, in case you don't know that. I have to really fight that. 
Because this is what Paul's talking about. He said, words can be weapons that can cut sharp as any knife. Maybe even sharper because, you know, flesh wounds will usually heal. But emotional and spiritual wounds often persist for a lifetime. The new life in Christ that you and I share is made possible by one thing. And that's because God has forgiven us in Jesus. It cost God dearly because he gave up everything he loved for you and me. And this is where the rubber hits the road for us as Christians. Because of God's forgiveness, we have to forgive one another. We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. And forgiveness is something that we have to do constantly in, on the ground as we live, in checking ourselves and our relationships with each other. It means that we agree that we're going to guard our tongues and use them for positive and loving words. It means we don't allow bitterness to take root in our souls because we're angry. Instead, we speak the truth in love, Paul says, with the sole purpose of reconciliation between us and encouraging us as one another when we walk along together. So this process of transformation is not easy. <coughs> you know, Christianity ain't for sissies. <laughs> Jesus said, count the cost there will be a cost. It's going to cost you everything. Everything you had before, <clears throat> he wants you to give to him now. And it isn't without pain because we're countercultural. We're against the world in a lot of ways. <clears throat> and sometimes people are not going to be real nice to you. So if you're always worried about somebody liking you, forget it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's why some people never want to leave behind their chameleon lives. They find it easier to live with the devil they know rather than seeking after the God who longs to know them. Now, some of you may still be chameleons. Maybe you haven't taken that step of faith to allow yourself to undergo that transformation that God waits patiently to bring to your spirit and your mind and your life. But taking the step is easy. It's simply inviting Jesus into your heart and asking him to forgive your sins and giving him permission to be the leader of your life. And then he's going to send his Holy Spirit to you and the transformation will begin. Now I think most of us here, and I know most of you pretty well, are more like the caterpillar who's in that cocoon and waiting for the transformation work to be completed. We're not butterflies yet, but we will be. I want to be one of those beautiful yellow ones. <laughs> but we're not ready yet, even are we? The work is ongoing between us and the Holy Spirit. And when the time is right, we will emerge completely transformed and perfectly beautiful. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you continually hold out your hand to us, inviting us to come to you, to receive the joyful, abundant, and everlasting life you offer. For those who have not accepted your invitation, we pray that they would open their hearts to you so that your spirit will enter in. For those of us who have grasped your hand in the past, Lord, may your grip of grace be strong and may we never lose our grip. We thank you for your forgiveness and the gift of your spirit who enables us to forgive others, for we don't have that capacity as human beings to forgive as we have been forgiven. But you do, Lord, and you do it through us by your spirit. We marvel at your work of transformation in the lives of your people, and in each one of us who knows you in this body, which is your church. We thank you that in you we are being changed to reflect your glory on earth as you restore our broken and dying lives into new and beautiful creations. Amen. Amen.